Okay, welcome to English Writing 3. I'm doing it this way so that you have a um, you have a set of English subtitles at the bottom to help you follow along. Um, I will be recording every lecture and uploading it to YouTube, and then I will post a link onto Moodle. So if you want to review the lecture, um, you can watch the recordings. So um, first, let me introduce you to our Moodle page. Everything you need to take this course is on Moodle. So if you um, miss a week or you're not sure about something, you can come and check the Moodle page. Uh, the first section of the Moodle page is course information. This is the basic information about the course. This is my email. If you click on my name on Moodle and it takes you to my Moodle profile, Moodle will give you a different email. That email doesn't work. If you want to contact me, please send an email to this email address. Then we have the Microsoft Teams code for this class. If for some reason you are not added into the Microsoft Teams and you need to access Teams, you can add yourself by putting in this code. You don't have to wait for the school. Then we have the syllabus. Uh, I'll talk about the syllabus a bit later. Then we have a detailed schedule because the syllabus can be a little messy. So I have organized the schedule into a clearer format. Uh, then we have class emails. If I need to announce something to you online, uh, like maybe I, I announced something in class and some people were not here, or something happens between classes and you need to know before the next class, I will post it here and Moodle will send an email to your school email account. Now, I know that not everybody checks your school email every day, so I will also post the same information on Microsoft Teams. Um, in any case, it's a good idea at least like once a week to check here or to check on Microsoft Teams just in case. Um, although the best thing to do would be to check your school email. Um, peer review guidelines. OK, I'll talk about that a bit later. Then we have. Um, let's take a look at the syllabus. I'll talk about the detailed schedule a bit later. OK, this is kind of important. Suggestions for learning guidance. Work hard, participate in class. And you'll be fine. So don't worry too much. It's not a it's a very low pressure class. Uh, the next thing, the textbook looks like this. Longman Academic Writing Series 5. We will be using this textbook for two semesters. Um, you don't have to buy it if you don't want to. I have posted all of the textbook information that you will need onto Moodle. But there are still reasons why you might want to buy the textbook. Let me do a very quick comparison contrast. Um, one of the units this semester is comparison contrast. So this is also an example. So why might you want to buy the textbook? First of all, uh, it's easier to take notes on paper. And we will do some of the practice questions in the textbook. And it's much easier to just write your answers there instead of like, finding another piece of paper, matching your answers to the questions, and then you have to worry about where will you keep the paper, etc. 
another reason is because we will not uh, we will not have time to do everything in the textbook, but the textbook is designed for self study. So all of the things that we don't do in the classroom, if you buy a textbook, you can do them at home and further improve your writing skills. Now, those are the advantages. What are the disadvantages? First of all, uh, as I said, we're not going to do everything in the textbook. There are 10 units in the book. Each semester, we will only do two units. So for the whole school year, we will do four out of 10 units. So if you don't plan on self studying the textbook, you may not find it useful to buy a copy. Another disadvantage is that the textbook does not have answers. So if you do self study and you want the answers, you will have to come to me and we will flip through this book which has the answers. Uh, or I would simply tell you whether you got it right or not. I don't really need that book. And there's one last disadvantage, which is the textbook costs $535. But it's your choice whether you want to buy one or not. Uh, if you do want to buy a copy, please come tell me during the break or after class. Um, and I will collect the number of textbooks we need. Uh, I'll go tell the school and when the books come, then uh, you can give me the money. So that's your choice. Then we have the grades. 20% of your final grade will be participation in class. This semester we are writing three essays. Each essay will be worth 20% of your final grade. I will only grade your final draft. Your first draft, your second draft, your third draft will not be graded. I will mark them, I will correct them, but I will only grade your final draft. So this can give you some flexibility. If uh, you're not quite sure what you want to write about. Uh, you can use your first draft to put your ideas on paper and I can help you sort through your ideas to come up with a better essay. If you decide to change ideas in the middle, totally fine as long as you can produce a good final draft. So for your first few drafts, don't worry, no pressure. Uh, it will not affect your final grade. And then there will be a coordinated final exam. So on week 18, uh, you guys will take the final exam with everybody else. And that is also worth 20%. Questions so far? OK, so the course system will only let me put in three grades daily grade, midterm grade, final grade. So how do we divide these? Well, the system wants me to put in a midterm grade during the semester. So your exposition essay final draft will be your midterm grade. The final exam will be your final exam grade. And the other two essays plus participation will be your daily grade. Is that clear? So at the end of the semester, um, if you want to calculate your grade, your midterm grade will only be your exposition essay, your final exam grade will only be your final exam, and your daily grade will be participation plus cause effect plus comparison contrast. Questions? OK. Let's take a look at the. Detailed schedule. Hang on, where did I where did I put the schedule? Uh, 
detailed schedule. So this is what we're going to do week by week. Week one today, introduction to the course and writing and basic grammar review. So I'm introducing the course now. After we finish with this, I will talk about English writing and for the rest of today, we will do a basic grammar review. Week two, we will begin the first unit on exposition essays. I will introduce how to write an exposition essay and we will read the essay in the textbook. Week three is not a holiday. I'm not quite sure why I wrote that it's a holiday. Um, I only discovered this uh, last period, but I need to fix this schedule. Um, but the next week will be reading an example essay that I have chosen that I think is a pretty good exposition essay. Then uh, it says week five, we will do peer review. So sometime before that week, uh, the, the previous week when we're discussing the example essay, I will divide you into groups. Each group will have around four people. And before the peer review class, you will exchange essays with your group members. So if your group has four people, then on the day of peer review, you should come here with your own essay and three other essays. Right, four group members, your essay and three other essays. And on I, I will explain in detail how to do that um, in, during the week before. But the basic idea is this. There is no objective standard for the perfect essay. Different people have different ideas about what makes a good essay. I am only one person. So in order to help improve your essay, uh, it's a good idea to let other people read it and give you feedback, share their ideas with you uh, so that when you finish writing the essay, more than just me will think that it's a good essay. Right? We want a well-rounded, comprehensive piece of writing. Uh, some of you might be thinking about studying abroad or going on exchange. You might need a writing sample. Uh, so it's a good idea to know how to create a well-rounded piece of writing that uh, different kinds of people would think is a good piece of writing. So the peer review is simply to let more and different kinds of people share their ideas with you about your essay. I'll explain in detail how to do that in probably not week four, but it says week four. Uh, week six, according to this schedule, you will hand in the draft of your exposition essay to me. When it says hand in, it means paper. I want a paper copy of your essay. I will spend the next week marking your essays and on it says week seven, I will return your essays to you and I will call you one by one to come and discuss your essay with me. To make sure you understand uh, why I made these kinds of corrections, how you can improve your writing. So when it says conference, it means a one on one conference with me. Now, week six, you have to hand in your essay. What will we do in class? We will begin the second unit and I will introduce cause and effect essays. So that's the and then week eight, we will in class, we will continue the cause and effect essay unit with an example that I have found that I think is a good cause effect essay. And you will have to submit the final draft of your exposition essay. When it says submit, that means upload it to Moodle. So hand in is give me a paper copy. Submit is submit to Moodle. 
So that's the basic pattern for each unit. Uh, so in the second unit, week six, it says introduction. Week eight is the example essay. Week nine, no class because of midterms. Week 10 is the peer review week. Week 11, you hand in the essay to me. Week 12 is the conference. And then week 13, you submit the final essay. Same for the third unit, comparison contrast. Uh, week 11, introduce the unit. Week 13 is the example essay. Week 14, peer review. Week 15, you hand in the essay to me. Now, there's no next unit. So what should we do in class? I think we can watch a movie. So you come here, you watch the movie, you hand in the draft to me. Week 16 is a conference. Week 17, uh, you have to submit the final draft to Moodle. And on week 17, we will do a mock exam, Um, I'm sure you all know the experience, right? High pressure exam, only one chance. You enter the room, you sit down, and you start writing whatever you can think of. You can't think clearly. You're so worried. And then later on, when you get your exam back, you can see all the stupid mistakes you made. So hopefully with the mock exam on week 17, you can work through that process before the actual exam. And so you can see what kind of mistakes you might make under high pressure. Now, I won't have time to mark all of your mock exams, so it will be a kind of self reflection. High pressure, write the exam, and then afterwards, I will remind you of the things that you should pay attention to, and you can see for yourself uh, if you have made those mistakes, and you can remind yourself not to make those mistakes on the actual exam, week 18. So that's the schedule. Do you have questions? It, it can be a little bit complicated because each unit kind of like switches around with the next unit, uh, but this kind of schedule is the most efficient kind for a writing course. Questions? OK, so I'll, I'll give you the uh, updated schedule like tonight or tomorrow or something. OK, so back to Moodle. Um, the peer review guidelines are here. I will talk about this the week before peer the first peer review, uh, but you're welcome to take a look uh, first if you want to. Participation and final exam, you can't see those, but this is where I will input your uh, participation grade and your final exam grade. I use Moodle to calculate your final grade. This means that you can also check your final grade on Moodle. If you go here and you click on grades, you will see your own score. Right now, uh, there's no score for anybody. I didn't input any grades. But you will see a complete list of all of your grades for um, each assignment, the exam, etc. And on the very right is the course total. I will take that number and I will put it into, I will find a way to make sure that the course system spits out the same number that appears here. On Moodle, it's very simple. Each thing is 20%, right? So the highest score for each essay is 20. And the highest score for the final exam is 20. And I'll just add everything together. And on the right hand side is your final grade. Um, so if you want to check your progress during the course, you can click on grades and uh, look here. Uh, OK, and then we have good English writing. This is. Um, an essay I wrote two years ago when I was the judge for the MCU Literary Awards English essay section. Uh, you're welcome to submit an essay this year if you're interested. Uh, as a judge, they 
the school asks me to like write some reflections on the process. Uh, and so I use that as an opportunity to write about what I think is good English writing. And uh, you can take a look at this when you have time. The basic idea is good English writing is clear and straightforward. Um, if you learned Chinese writing in high school, junior high, your teacher probably told you, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should make the essay look beautiful. English doesn't care too much about that. In English, the sentence level prizes clarity. The reader can understand what you mean immediately. Now, you do still have to work on the like design of the English essay, but not on a sentence level. It's on a bigger structure level. So things like what do you put in? What do you leave out? What order should you put these things into? Those are the things that uh, English writing cares about. But on the basic sentence level, SVO, 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 go right ahead. Uh, and then we have an article on plagiarism. Plagiarism is stealing other people's ideas. This article is in Chinese. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it goes into the history of plagiarism in late China. And the idea is that before Western ideas and technology entered China, there was not really a clear sense of what is plagiarism, what is stealing ideas. So the idea of plagiarism is actually connected to Western uh, structures of knowledge. Now, because we are the applied English department and we're studying in a Western style university and we are connected on the international academic stage, we do have to follow Western standards of plagiarism. But if you're curious about why we have these standards and why it it's it's not always easy to understand. You can take a look at this article. Uh, for the purposes of this class, if you use someone else's ideas or language and you pretend that it's yours, you don't tell me it's from somewhere else. That is plagiarism. It's stealing other people's ideas. Why is this serious? Well, think about this. Why do you need to produce good essays in this class? For a good grade. Why do you need a good grade? So that you can graduate and you can get that piece of paper. Why do you need that? So that you can get a job, so that you can make money and support yourself. So if you steal someone's ideas and you pretend that those ideas are your own, it's the same as stealing someone else's essay. And if you steal someone else's essay, you're basically stealing their grade. And if you steal their grade, you're basically stealing your degree. And if you steal the degree and you use that degree to get a job, you are stealing a job. So don't steal other people's ideas or language. If you do see someone or hear someone say something that you think is like perfect, you have to put it in your essay. You can put it in your essay, but you should tell me it's not yours. You have to tell me where you found this idea. So I'm not asking you to like write something original every single time. I'm merely asking you to tell me when some part of your essay is not original and where you found that part. OK. Does that make sense? If you hand in an essay that has some parts that are plagiarized, 
So it doesn't have to be the entire essay is stolen. Even some parts were stolen. I will not mark your essay. If you submit a final draft that has plagiarism in it, I will give you a zero. And the basic standard is if I can tell where you found it, then it's plagiarism. Questions? Like again, just tell me where you found the idea. There's no reason you have to run the risk of failing this course simply because like you didn't tell me this came from somewhere else. Um, I will also add another file later, which is um, there is something cool you can do um, with an English language video that you can't do with a Chinese language video. As I said, I will record each lecture and upload it to YouTube. YouTube will generate automatically English subtitles and an English transcript. So because the transcript will appear on the screen, you can search for specific words that I say in the video. So if you want to review a lesson, but you don't want to review the whole lesson, you just want to review a specific part, you can turn on the transcript and you can search for that part. Uh, so it can be a more efficient way of reviewing. Um, I will post a file later to show you how to turn on the subtitles and how to open the transcript on YouTube. The transcript only works on a computer, not on your phone. Um, and it usually will take YouTube around a day to add the subtitles. So if I post the video on Monday, come back and check on like late Tuesday, early Wednesday for the subtitles. OK, uh, and then we have each unit. Each unit looks like this. The first PowerPoint file is from the textbook. Uh, the second PDF file is the example essay. And then the third thing is where you can submit your final draft. And then there's a, a window of time where it, during which you can submit the essay. And when you submit it to Moodle, please only use PDF files. If you try to submit a different kind of file, the system will not let you submit. So that's the first unit, exposition. Second unit, cause effect. Again, textbook PowerPoint, PDF, example essay, submission space. Third unit, comparison contrast. This looks a little different because the first file is taken from a different textbook. Um, we, we've been teaching this course this way for a number of years, so I'm not sure who first made the decision, but this textbook does not have a comparison contrast unit, so we took the unit from a different textbook. Uh, and we will be uh, talking about that on that week. Then the second file again, example essay, and then you have the submission space. And that's it. So do you have questions about the Moodle page? Do you have questions about this course? OK, so you will be writing three essays. You will decide the topic of each essay. I will not give you essay topics. Um, so it's always a good idea to think about uh, what are you interested in? What would you like to write about? Um, that would fit each kind of essay. Um, so next week I will introduce the exposition essay. This week, what did it say? Introduction to course, English writing. We talked about good English writing, right? So we finished that. Basic grammar review. Yes, I love grammar. Okay, 
so uh, you guys have already spent a whole year learning about grammar, right? Um, so I'm not going to repeat everything. I'm just going to talk about um, the basic ideas of grammar that I think will be useful for you. Uh, let's see, how should I do this? While I'm thinking about this, uh, let me like uh, give you a few commercials. So first of all, um, I'm teaching this course all Monday afternoon. So like before this section, there's another section of English writing three in fifth and sixth periods. So if you can't make it to class during seventh and eighth periods, you are welcome to sneak into fifth and sixth periods. It will be the same thing. Um, OK, next commercial. So uh, I'm also teaching a class called English Debate. And that will happen on Thursdays, fifth and sixth periods. You're all very welcome to come. There's actually a very strong connection between debating and good writing. Both depend on clear thinking. Um, and the debate class will be very practical. There will be lots of practice and there will be lots of debating. So you're all very welcome to come and uh, take that course. In fact, I do hope you come because currently I don't have enough students uh, and the course might be shut down. So, you know, if you have any interest in debating, please come join us on Thursday, fifth and sixth periods. One more commercial. Um, I'm also co-advising the English Elite Club, English uh, English Fridays, fifth period. Um, and it's uh, basically it's a student club uh, where we will spend an hour doing things in English, talking about things in English, and we might also work on some of your international exchange or study abroad materials. Um, the first meeting is next Friday because this Friday is a holiday. Uh, and the first week I will talk with the students, see what they want to get out of the uh, club. Then we will work out a schedule based on that. So you're all very welcome to come and join us Friday fifth period for the English Elite Club. OK, those are the commercials. Grammar. Um, here's the thing. If I try to give examples on here, this happens and you can't see what I'm writing. So we're going to have to use the computer. But that means you will not have well, I guess you may have subtitles. That's how do we do this? Um, OK, great, you can still see subtitles. So let's talk about grammar. The most important idea I want you to take away from this grammar review is that the basic sentence uh, sentence structure of English looks like this. You are probably familiar with the first three symbols, SVO. The fourth symbol represents everything else. Time, place, tool, companion, condition, reason, cause, effect, period of duration, possibility, Everything else in an English sentence. Goes in the back, so when I say. I went to have oh, actually hang on. I had dinner with my friend last week at a. Restaurant. Honey, I Subject, I, verb, had, object, dinner. Everything else goes in the back. Companion, my friend. 
when last week, where at a Kenyan restaurant. It all goes in the back. This is different from Chinese, right? If I wanted to say this idea in Chinese, I would say, wo sang zhou gen peng you qu kenya chan ting chi guan chan. Right? In Chinese, we move all of that information near the front. So this is something to pay attention to when you're writing an essay. Remember that this is the natural order in English. But sometimes you don't want to use the natural order. Sometimes you want to emphasize one of those things. In that case, you can move it to the front, but remember to add. The comma tells the reader that this information has been moved. It doesn't belong here. You moved it here so that the reader will notice it. So to take our example sentence, you might say last week, comma, I had dinner with my friend at a Kenyan restaurant. You might say at a Kenyan restaurant last week, comma, I had dinner with my friend. Right. Anytime you move that to the front, remember to add the comma. Now, every complete English sentence may not have an object, may not have a subject. If I say there were five people in the room, what's the subject? No subject. There were no subject. In Chinese, it would be yo. But every complete English sentence will have a main verb cluster. And I don't say verb, I say verb cluster because, as you know, many times it will not just be one word. But there will only be one main verb cluster. If you write a sentence and you keep writing and you keep writing and you realize that you have two main verb clusters, something has gone wrong and you need to do sentence surgery. That is not a complete English sentence because you have two subjects, two objects, and two main verb clusters. So you need to do some surgery. How can you make this sentence grammatical? How can you fix this sentence? The first way uh, but sometimes you, you don't want to separate it into two sentences. Sometimes you want to show that there is some kind of connection, some kind of relation between these two sentences. In that case, you can use a comma and something else. You cannot only use a comma. English does not let you connect two sentences with only a comma and nothing else. It has to be followed by something. That something will tell you the relation between these two sentences. If these two sentences go together, and if they are in opposite directions, you can only choose one of the two sentences. If the first sentence causes the second sentence, if the second sentence causes the first sentence, those are the five basic relations to connect an English sentence. They go together and they go in opposite directions, but you can only choose one or the first one causes the second one. So the second one causes the first one for. Remember that you have to use a comma and one of these words. But let's say. 
that is now 11.45 p.m. And your deadline is in 10 minutes. And you know that this is incorrect. But you don't have the time or the energy to think about which connection to use. There is one very dangerous trick you can do. And it's dangerous because if you do this in the wrong place, in the wrong document, it could lead to an explosion. Semicolon. When should you use a semicolon? You can use a semicolon to connect two complete sentences that are related to each other, but the relation is not so easily expressed using one of those five words. Sometimes two sentences go together, but the relationship is a little complicated. Sometimes like maybe they mostly go together, but not all of it. Maybe you can choose part of one sentence and part of the other sentence. For those complicated, subtle connections, you can use a semicolon. Now, I mentioned an explosion. And this is because the semicolon is only one of two English punctuation marks where you can do this. This is a grammatical sentence. You can go on and on and on, and it is perfectly grammatically correct. Now, it's not a good idea, right? Because what you're doing is you're being lazy. You're saying these sentences are connected, but I can't be bothered to tell you what the connection is. You're the reader, you figure it out, which is the wrong attitude to have as a writer. Remember, English likes clear, straightforward writing, which means you don't want the reader to do the work. You want to make everything perfectly clear for the reader. This is not perfectly clear. This is something you would only have to do when you have 30 seconds before the deadline. There is no other situation where I will say that's a good sentence. But if you do have to use this very dark, very dangerous idea, it is grammatically correct. OK, do you have questions about basic uh, English sentence structure? OK, let's go into more detail. We're going to be talking about um, nouns and then verbs. But before that, what is a noun? Your grammar teacher probably told you person, place, thing, idea, something like that, right? Something you can grab onto, something you can think about in your mind. And therefore, what is a verb? A verb is an action, something that affects something else. Sound familiar? Yeah? Those are not technically the correct definitions of noun and verb. The definition of a noun is any word that you can use as a subject or an object. The definition of verb is any word that you can put in the V position of a sentence. The definition has nothing to do with the idea of the word. So you might see a sentence like this. I gifted him the invite last week. What is the main verb? I is the subject, right? Him is the uh, indirect object. So it looks like the main verb is gifted. But wait, isn't gift a noun? 
not if it appears in this position. If it fits in that position, it is a verb. Similarly, what did I gift him? I gifted him the invite. Now, invite looks like a verb, but it appears in the object position. Therefore, it must be a noun. Now, I am very sorry to say that this is something that an American might actually say. Uh, of course, the more proper way to say this is that I gave him the invitation. But for some reason, uh, it has become fashionable in English to use gift as a verb and invite as a noun. Now you can understand why that works, because it's not the idea of the word, it's the position of the word in the sentence. OK, let's start with nouns. Uh, and the basic separation of nouns is between countable and uncountable nouns. Now, again, your grammar teacher probably told you something like, uh, if you can count the nouns, that they are countable. If it does not make sense to count the nouns, then it isn't uncountable. You can count cars. You can't count water. Therefore, cars countable, water is uncountable. Again, that's not exactly accurate. It works most of the time, right? But the actual rule is if you can put A in front of a noun or you can put S at the end of the noun, it is and, and it makes sense, then it's countable. If you can't do that, it's uncountable. But rem look at remember that really weird grammar example where a, a noun turned into a verb and a verb turned into a noun. You can also make countable nouns uncountable and uncountable nouns countable. How do you get to school? By car. There's no A in front of this car. There's no S behind this car. Therefore, this word car is uncountable. What does that mean? Why is it suddenly uncountable? What is that like when you think about it philosophically? What idea does this mean by uncountable car? It means that how do I get to school? I don't take any specific car, right? I don't take this car. I don't take that car. The kind of thing that I use is a car. So it's not a concrete car. It is the abstract idea of cars. It's an abstract idea and you can't count abstraction. Therefore, it is uncountable. If you go to a restaurant and the waiter asks you, what will you have? And you only want a glass of water, you can say. One water, please. Water should be uncountable, but when you count it, it creates its own unit. You're not saying one drop of water. You're saying one glass of water or one bottle of water. You're not sure how the restaurant serves water, but you're asking for one whatever it is. So water suddenly becomes countable. So again, the definition of counter and non-count nouns is not the idea of the word. It is its position in the sentence. Let's take a short break.
so we have been talking about countable and uncountable nouns. Before we continue, I want to show you. Um, I said that um, because the video will be in English, you can turn on automatically generated English subtitles, and this is how to do it. Um, here, here, depending on whether you're on your computer or on um, your phone, these are some ways to uh, turn on the subtitles. And if you're on a computer, you can also turn on the transcript like this. And it will show up on the right hand side so you can search for keywords and it will bring you to that part of the video and you can click on it and the video will jump over. Um, so this is on Moodle for your reference if you ever need to do this. OK, so we've been talking about countable and uncountable nouns, but there is one word that we have not mentioned. The. This word I am sure has caused many headaches for you. What does it mean? Where do we use it? First off, it is very important to remember that the word the has nothing to do with whether a noun is countable or uncountable. You can add the to a countable noun. You can add the to an uncountable noun. No difference. The function of the word the is to create a kind of frame. Or in Chinese, the similar uh, word is mo. Or like, you know, in English we might say some, someone, a certain person, some thing. It, it doesn't tell you what that thing is. It only tells you to focus on that thing. That's what the word the does. Out of many different nouns, or I should say out of many different examples of the same noun, it asks you to focus on this one or sometimes this group. It's a frame, it's like a quang quang. Uh, so for example, um, I see five cars, but th um, my friend owns the car with the yellow paint. So only the yellow car. So out of five cars, only one of them is yellow, and I'm only talking about that car. The word the tells you it is only this selection. Uh, I could also say there are five cars. Three of the cars are broken. When I say three of the cars, I'm telling you I'm specifically talking about those five cars. Out of those five cars, three are broken. So the function of the word the is to make sure you know I'm talking about this thing or this group. And that's why uh, grammar teachers will tell you if there's only one, use the, right? The best, the highest, the teacher. In this room, there's only one teacher, so you use the. But you can also say the students. Because in this room, there's only one group of students, you guys. So the just means the specific thing or group of things. So it has nothing to do with countable or uncountable. If you need to specify, add the word the. Clear? Do you have questions? So the rule is like this, but uh, to apply the rule can sometimes be ambiguous. So usually we take it on a case by case uh, basis. We'll look at each case individually, but the basic rule 
is to specify something. Now, up to this point, we have been talking about nouns that are only one word. But nouns don't have to be one word. For example, you can take an entire complete sentence and change it into a noun. By adding the word that in front of this complete sentence, I have transformed this complete sentence, subject, verb, object, everything else, into a noun. So the subject of this entire sentence is that I gifted him the invite last week. The verb is is. Uh, and because be verbs are very weird, they don't take an object, but the rest of the sentence is good. This is a complete sentence. You only need the word that. But often in English, uh, people will say the fact that it sounds better. This is turning a sentence into a subject. You can also turn a sentence into an object using the same logic. I like the fact that I gifted him the invite last week. That doesn't make sense. Sorry. You, you like the fact. Oh, hang on. She, she like. OK, that's good. She likes the fact that I gifted him the invite last week. So in this sentence, the subject is she. The verb is likes and the object is. The fact that I gifted him the invite last week is one noun. So like if you're writing a sentence and you realized, oh no, I now have two complete sentences. But it doesn't feel like you should connect them. It feels like one sentence belongs as part of the other sentence. This is one way you can fix that problem. Add the word that in front of the sentence you want to turn into a thing and make it part of the bigger sentence. So in this sentence, I gifted him the invite last week is one event. This event is the object of the sentence. There's another way to create longer nouns, and it involves the use of the word, sorry, of the grammatical item known as the gerund. Uh, so this is to take a verb, turn it into a noun. I like driving. I is the subject, like is the verb. Driving, even though it's a verb, in this case is a gerund and therefore can be used as a noun. So driving is the object. Now this kind of noun is special because, remember it used to be a verb, right? Um, so for instance, you might have something like this. I drive my car. That's a sentence. But if you want to make, if you want to put this into a bigger sentence, if you want to change this into a noun to fit into a bigger sentence, the verb can carry the object with it, right? You change the verb to a gerund, and it will also bring the object with it into the new sentence. In fact, if the original sentence has a subject that you want to bring into the new sentence, 
you can also bring the subject into the sen new sentence. But remember, each sentence can only have like one subject. So what do you do with the second subject? Turn it into a possessive. I like his driving my car simply means I like the fact that he drives my car. The meaning is the same. Uh, it's a different way to turn a sentence into a noun. Uh, often in English, you will see people add an of here. I like his driving of my car. This means I like the way that he drives my car. Now, I'm not asking you to be able to write this kind of sentence, but when you read, sometimes you will come across um, uncommon sentence patterns. And because they are uncommon, you may not be prepared. And when you come across a sentence like this, you might be a bit confused. So today I'm simply giving you some tools. Hopefully, if you run across this kind of sentence, you will remember that somebody once introduced this kind of thing to you before, and hopefully you can figure out what the sentence means. So those are nouns. Do you have questions? OK, let's move on to verbs. And as I'm sure you remember, verbs can get a bit complicated. So try to keep in mind this specific concept as we go along. There are two ways to look at verbs. Sense and aspect. In Chinese, we translate this as shi and tai. These are two different ideas. In English, there is only three different tenses, past, present, future. These three, you can think of them as the objective time. Through your entire essay, the time should be the same. The whole essay happened in the past, or the whole essay is happening right now, or the whole essay will happen in the future. Nothing you say in the essay should change the tense. Unless you're specifically like jumping into the future or jumping into the past, but any regular sentence should not change the tense. Past, present, future. The complicated stuff is the aspect. Now the def if tense is the objective time of an essay, the entire essay. The aspect is the relationship between one sentence and another sentence. Um, English has three main aspects. Progressive, perfect and perfect progressive. Let's start from the easy one. Chinese we call this Jing Xing Si. And your grammar teacher probably told you if it continues for some time, use progressive, right? It's not just one moment, it's continuing. Again, that's not exactly accurate. Aspects tell you the relationship between two sentences. For example, I was driving on the highway. Suddenly, my phone rang. Now, if you think about this second sentence, suddenly my phone rang. That takes time, right? Your phone doesn't just ring and stop unless it's like a like a marketing company or something. Usually your phone keeps ringing. So why don't we say your phone started ringing? Why do we simply say my phone rang? Because it is not about the action itself. It is the relation between the two sentences. In this situation, I want to emphasize that my phone rang while I was driving. So if you take these two events, driving, phone ringing, 
I want to emphasize that the continuous event is the driving. Right, it only it doesn't make sense to think about the phone continuing to ring, but you're only driving for a moment. Like if you say I drove and my phone started ringing. That doesn't really make sense. You have to say I was driving and my phone rang. You're you're it's the relationship between these two sentences. Uh, the phone rang while I was driving, something like that. So the point is not does the action take time? Every action takes time. The point is, is it important to let people know that this action was continuing compared to your other actions in the essay, compared to the other sentences? The second common aspect of English is called the perfect aspect. Uh, and is expressed using what's known as the past participle, um, So, for example, the third one, drive, drove, driven. Driven is the past participle. When do we use the perfect aspect? If you learn grammar using Chinese, you might think, oh, when something is finished, then you use the perfect aspect. But if that's true, what is the difference between the perfect aspect and simple past tense? When we say the past tense, those actions are also finished. They're in the past. So when do you use past tense and when do you use perfect aspect? Again, the idea is that it influences the next sentence. The fact that this event has finished influences the next sentence. So, for example, um, I might say, I ate lunch 10 minutes ago. Simple sentence. It doesn't really influence any other sentence. It's a fact. I ate lunch 10 minutes ago. But if a friend walks in and says, hey, CJ, do you want to go have lunch together? Or like, do you want to go eat lunch together? I might answer my friend, sorry, but I have eaten my lunch 10 minutes ago. And my next sentence might be like, sorry, I can't go with you. Or maybe my friend will say, oh, that's OK. I'll eat with you next time. Right. The fact that I have finished eating my lunch influences the next sentence. In that case, you would use the perfect aspect. So remember the relation between sentences. Uh, up to this mo point, do you have questions? OK, before we move on, I want to point to. Uh, one pattern that you can pay attention to. Um, so we talked about tenses. There are only three tenses, right? Past. Present. Future. That's not future. Future. Talk about the aspects. Same thing, only three tenses past, present, future. When we talk about a uh, perfect aspect, The future. There is a pattern here. Each word carries only one grammatical idea. This word carries the idea of past 
or present or future. The first word carries the tense. But the choice of what is this word plus the format of the second word gives us the aspect. So it's B plus a word that ends in ing gives us the progressive aspect. So one word carries one grammar idea. First word is tense, second word is aspect. Same thing here, right? First word is tense, it's present. And because you use the word have, plus the second word is the past participle, guotrifensi, and that gives us the perfect aspect, perfect aspect. Third aspect is called the perfect progressive. It's the same idea. First word gives us the past or the present or the future. This is the tense. The choice of the word have plus the past participle gives us the perfect aspect. The choice of the word be plus the, uh, this is actually the present participle, but we'll just say it's the ing ending, gives us the progressive aspect. So it's past, perfect, progressive. That's the pattern. One word per grammar idea. So that's how you write this aspect. What does it mean? Well, progressive means that it took some time. It continued for a while, and that influences the next sentence. Perfect means that it finished, and the fact that it finished influences the next sentence. Perfect progressive means that it has finished and the fact that it took a long time before it finished influences the next sentence. So let's say I just drove here from Kaohsiung and I just walk in the door and the first thing that happens is some student comes up to me and says, teacher, teacher, will you please correct my essay? My answer will probably be maybe later. I have just been driving all the way from Kaohsiung. I'm kind of tired. So I don't say I drove here from Kaohsiung. I don't say I was driving here from Kaohsiung. I say, I have been driving here from Kaohsiung because I got here, so the driving has ended, it's finished, but it took me a long time. And both of those ideas put together influence my next sentence, which is maybe later, let me rest first. If it's simply that I have finished driving, uh, the next sentence would be like uh, welcoming the next event. If it is only because I ha I was driving for a period of time, uh, it doesn't really influence the next thing because I'm already here. You have to combine both ideas. I have finished driving and it took me a long time. Therefore, I'm kind of tired, maybe later. So both ideas together influence the next sentence. That is the perfect progressive aspect once in Jing Jing Shi. Do you have questions? OK, so one last thing I want to talk about for verbs. We've talked about tense, we've talked about aspect. Now it's time to talk about voice. Voice is who is talking. In English, there are only two voices. Active voice and passive voice. All of these examples have been active voice. 
like these grammar words, these really weird grammar words, right? Aspect, tense, progressive, perfect, voice. These words can be used to describe any language. Today we're talking about English, but if, for example, we were talking about ancient Greek, ancient Greece has three voices, active, passive, and something called the middle voice. And the middle voice does not tell you who is talking. It doesn't say who is doing what to whom. It simply presents an event and it lets the reader uh, decide whether they need to figure out who's doing what. But in English, you have to tell the reader. So we have active and we have passive voice. Now, remember the concept, one word for each grammar idea. The passive follows the same rule. Uh, I'll give you a sentence just to uh, make it clear. I was driven to school by my girlfriend. It's an example. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't have a boyfriend either. Uh, so you can see from this sentence. One word. For the tense past, present, future. And you use the word be plus the past participle. And that tells us that this is the passive voice. So like this is B plus present participle. This is have plus past participle. This is B plus past participle. And that's how you can tell what kind of sentence this is. Right, was driven, was is the past B plus past participle means passive. Is driven is is the present B plus past participle is. Passive and the same for the future. So if you remember these rules, you can start to come up with, with some very entertaining sentences. The school should have been being repaired after the typhoon, but there were too many students on campus for the first week of classes. So the basic idea is clear, right? Typhoon came, destroyed the school. The school now needs to do repairs, but they can't do that because there are too many students walking around and it can be dangerous. That's the basic idea. But I just explained that idea using five sentences. This is just one sentence. And um, so this sentence is split into two halves because it uses the word should, should have, which means it is supposed to happen, but it's not actually happening. Why is it not actually happening? Because of the second half of this sentence. This is the reason why the first half is not happening. Let's look at the first half. Should have means it's supposed to happen, but it's not really happening. Have been being so choice of have. So it's present tense. Um, no, sorry, it's not present tense. It's supposed to happen. Have been have plus 
past participle. That's a perfect. Been being B plus ing. That's progressive. And then being repaired B plus past participle. That's passive. So the idea of this sentence is. The thing that is repaired is the school that comes first, so it's passive. And we sh it, sh it the repairs. Take a long time to finish. That's why we have the progressive in the middle. It takes a long time combined with the perfect in order to finish. So the school should have been being repaired after the typhoon means after the typhoon left, it would take a week, two weeks, a month, two months. And through those two months, when you walk around campus, you will still see people repairing the campus. It will take a long time to finish. So there's so many ideas that fit into one sentence because of the grammar. Again, I'm not asking you to be able to write this kind of sentence, but if you come across this kind of sentence in the wild, I hope that you can understand what it's trying to tell you. As for what you do write, this is a complicated sentence, right? If you see this sentence and I don't explain anything, it's not easy to understand the sentence, right? This is why English likes to see clear, straightforward writing, not this. I would rather you use five sentences to express this idea. Because five sentences just takes a little more time, but the reader will get it. If you throw this sentence at the reader, the reader might give up. So it's always better to have clear and straightforward writing. This is just in case whatever you're reading is not clear and straightforward. Do you have questions about verbs? OK. Um, so there's a lot more to English grammar than just this, as I'm sure you know or remember, hopefully. Um, but these are just the basic ideas that I think should be enough to get you through this semester. You may not even need to use a lot of this. Um, but you know, just in case. And if you ever need to review, uh, I will post the video like maybe tonight or tomorrow. And if you wait another day, um, there will be subtitles in the transcript for you to uh, to help you review. OK, so do you have questions about what we have talked about today? OK, great, so that's it. Um, if you have not yet signed in, please come sign in. If you want to buy a textbook, please come tell me. Otherwise, you are free to go. See you next week.